I'm Donald Leggett and welcome to our latest London South East CEO interview. Our guest today is David Trainer, CEO of Biotrol, the AIM-listed specialist antimicrobial technology company. Welcome, David. Morning, thank you. How would you describe Biotrol to those less familiar with you? 25% uh, of our staff, <coughs> our staff are lab-based, so we're first and foremost a science and technology company. Um, we are in the world of infection uh, control and prevention. And we do that through biocides. And biocides are liquid products formats that uh, uh, eliminate bacteria, viruses, algae, and fungi from places where you don't want them. We sell our products into business premises. Um, we call that professionals, so that's biotrol based products for use uh, in business and in consumer uh, environments. And that is biotrol based products for use on your hands, bodies, home, pet, uh, and life. And we make our money from a combination of product sale, i.e. gross margin against cost of goods, uh, and technical development agreement and license agreement, um, uh, trying to take advantage of the scientific position that we have. And do you actually manufacture products yourself, or is it that you leave that to a manufacturer? No, it's all, it's all, it's all outsourced uh, at the moment. We have factories throughout the UK uh, and uh, some overseas as well, but mostly UK. So you, you have production agreements for those people? Yes, we do standard production agreements. Um, uh, we're quite uh, careful to ensure that the legality of it all is signed up very correctly. Okay. And uh, to what extent has the current pandemic boosted the short-term demand for hand sanitizers? Um, well, it's, well, it's not hand sanitizers, it's surface sanitizers as well. So we sell products to, for, 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 um, for use on skin uh, and your bodies, but also on surfaces. Um, of course, it's boosted things massively. Um, but what I would say is that what it's doing is magnifying uh, and uh, accelerating trends in our marketplace that had already been in place the last three to five years, and that frankly we're very well positioned for. Um, so maybe I'll just segue into that a little bit because it's key to understanding how the how the business is structured. Um, <clears throat> so the, the demand for biocides worldwide is massive, tens of billions worldwide uh, in dollar terms. And the demand for the active ingredients within those products also massive in the billions. And it's growing at 3 to 5% per year. So you've got massive global demand. <clears throat> the supply situation is also interesting, which is quite fragmented. So you've got massive uh, global uh, commodity-minded supplies of chemical ingredients uh, at one end, and they're moving through uh, their customers and through the FMCGs, the fast-moving consumer good companies, to mama pop operations that do cleaning factories and cleaning homes. It's huge fragmentation. So in <clears throat> pure uh, market analysis terms, massive demand, fragmented market. Mm -hmm. The big thing that's changed in the last few years and which we've been working towards is that there's been a huge new slew of regulation in our marketplace because regulators and governments, of course, onto the fact that biocides can, do, can cause damage in the environment if used incorrectly, and they won't say that. And they are increasingly... Uh, uh, um, forcing companies to get specific approvals for the active ingredients they use and then the products that, that uh, uh, those active ingredients go into. So what's happening is a lot of the weaker players are being taken out uh, and the stronger players are getting stronger because they're barriers to entry uh, to get into that marketplace. So if you put those two things together, massive demand, fragmented supply place and then big regulatory change, you can see a, contract, a, a big um, a structural shift in the industry that benefits those people that take a relatively scientific and regulatory driven approach to the business, which we were doing. And all that COVID has done, although it's massive for society, it has absolutely accelerated those trends. So you've got a supply shock in terms of supply taking place and a massive demand shock created by COVID. That is, I mean, that's propitious for us in a business sense, I mean, to huge, huge margins. I would have thought in a, in a, in a further broader sense, it actually raises people's general awareness of such things. Which, in, which can do no harm. Yes, and I think, I think in the future, so the world is now different, and that's a much used phrase, um, but in business, in, in business terms, uh, employees are now gonna have to make sure their premises are, are sanitized and are safe for employees, for customers, and for users uh, of their services. And consumers are now worrying about how they're gonna protect themselves against the risks from infection. So, and that feeling consumers is so visceral and deep, that's never gonna go away. So the new normal is changes everything that we're doing and makes puts us right at the epicenter of ongoing world health. Everything's changed. And if you combine that with the supply shot taking place because uh, uh, companies now space are being forced to have their chemistries regulated and approved, and it's a lengthy, painful, and expensive process to go through, 
I mean, it, it, this is massive uh, for our sector. Have you had problems uh, getting hold of your biocidal ingredients and, and uh, you know, supply, uh, supply chain uh, issues? Well, I think it, I mean, it's certainly, so we're, we're a six million pound business to the year 31st March 2020 in, in revenue. We ain't going to turn into 60 million pound business uh, overall, um, but we can grow quite fast uh, from that six million base. We have been doing that. The initial constraint was packaging. So most of our product, products have some degree of technical packaging of foam dispenser heads or trigger dispenser heads. Guess where all those products were made? China. China. So when, yeah, and so, that way. Were, <laughs> <laughs> so there was an immediate shortage of that that caused some problems that are now uh, largely resolved. There were some capacity issues amongst the manufacturers, and now that's. So do you problem. find that China's open for business again? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's, certainly, it's certainly freeing up. Um, the bigger issue now, though, are the individual ingredients. So we make cocktails of biocides to try and get the right combination of uh, antimicrobial effect, but also with sustainability characteristics and safety characteristics and regulatory characteristics. And what we find, what we're finding is that um, the individual countries specialise in individual supply of individual chemicals. And when you get a national lockdown, suddenly you find that one particular ingredient you hadn't even thought of suddenly becomes a problem to supply into your, in, into your supply chain. So, for instance, there's one ingredient that we used that I knew we had three global suppliers of. And then I, was, I got a telephone call to report that actually um, that ingredient was all being made in India. So the three suppliers were all buying from India and India was in lockdown. So the good news is there's a fair degree of stock uh, around and we've been buying up in advance to keep the, the wheels turning. But it is certainly a constraint. And my, my view is that as, the, um, as countries come out of lockdown, that's all going to change. We'll probably be fine. Uh, to get through to that point. Do you find in the future people will have shorter supply chains and think about where their, their end, end sourcing actually is and be a little bit more cautious about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, but but I, think, I think we are increasing our stock, uh, particularly of ingredients, uh, and I think most people are doing that. And I think we'll be looking a lot more broadly about um, if it is through an international supply chain, we'll be spreading out amongst different countries to protect ourselves against this happening again. So less just-in-time supply? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely fascinating. Okay, why not ask you about sales momentum? Clearly, it's been a cracking, a cracking uh, year. Uh, momentum is strong, you tell us. Uh, yeah. At record levels, projected sales numbers look very good. <clears throat> what, about, what about I could drill down on what sales numbers you expect for 2020, what sales numbers you expect for 2021, and what can I, I don't know how you, 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 you work your business, but margins, do, do you look at the gross margins or the net margins? Give us what detail you can. Yeah, okay, so, so we, um, in the year to March 2020, we've already told the market what our revenue and expected EBITDA was going to be. So revenue is six million pounds, EBITDA about 250 grand. We haven't yet had that audited, so it's subject to change, but we think it's about there. Um, we haven't released guidance for, the, for the, uh, this current year to March 2021, um, because it's moving around quite a lot. We wanna make sure we get it right on the upside and the downside. Um, um, uh, but what I would say is that in March, we did a million quid in revenue. Uh, and in April, we did a million quid in revenue. And May, I'm pretty sure we'd be about the same level. Um, so you put those numbers together, you can see that actually we're majorly ahead of where we were this time last year. And I think that's going to endure as well. The question is, how long will it endure for at those levels? In margin terms, uh, we, because we outsource most manufacturing, I would say our gross margin is between 20 and 40% across our different product suite. But because we also license out our technologies and we do technical development agreements, that is very, very high margin indeed for obvious reasons. So um, uh, when you look at the blended margin across the business, that's actually going to be quite high as well because we're selling more product, slightly better prices, but also doing more technical agreements as the overall mix. Crikey, you've uh, told me an awful lot there. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, okay, let's turn to license agreements. We've been touching on them all the way through. So part of that growth strategy is uh, to sign license agreements with, with, with major third parties. And you're doing very well. You just signed, uh, signed uh, two more in the, last, what, in the last three months. Well, I think, I think the first thing to say is licensing is a really interesting area uh, uh, for us because it ties us up with really good, impressive companies in our space and gets us out to more customers uh, in more formats, with better logistics and better efficiency than we can possibly do on our own. So it's a great, it's a great place to be. Um, and what it does, it also stands testament to the quality of the science we put in place. Because if, uh, if we weren't, if we didn't have fantastic scientists talking the same level as our customers and our licensees, they wouldn't want to deal with us. Um, 
So, so it's all good stuff. So when people are looking at our, our numbers for the year, they can look at what it is we are um, putting into our P&L for licensing. And they can sort, sort of work out across a series of licenses what the average income is like to be in each year. Okay. So you see this as a, a, a good deal for you because you don't spread yourself too thin in the States. Um, let's take that back to your marketing spend. You're not having to worry about the States. How much marketing spend do you have and where will you therefore be focusing that? Most of our money goes into science so far, historically. The team's been a bit quiet uh, publicly since uh, the current team took over in 2013 because we are focusing on getting the best science we could that's going to be regulatory approved and have some degree of differentiation. So um, about a year and a half ago, we bought a sales and marketing business that is helping us to distribute uh, more, more product. And we're now increasing the marketing spend um, uh, to a level that um, is higher than we ever had before. So I think, uh, I think in our last accounts, our um, research and development spend was about 450 grand. Marketing spend is going to be, um, uh, is going to be in the hundreds of thousands, um, but we're not quite sure exactly how much this year. So for instance, you know, we had a, uh, several uh, conference and exhibitions um, organised for this year with a decent lump of cash going into that. And of course, most of those are being cancelled. Mm. So now we're looking at some more efficient use of that marketing spend. But in the future, that's, you'd like to keep that percentage either yeah. similar yeah, yeah. Or, 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 or grow it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we need to, we need to get the message out um, uh, broadly uh, to, uh, um, to consumers and businesses and customers as to the quality of the science that we have, because we have something really quite special now. But it's mainly B2B, is it? Well, in terms of define B2B, it is mostly B2B in terms of dealing with businesses, but we would define B2C as something that ends up on consumers. So, for instance, my pitch to a um, consumer-facing company is as much about consumer insight, needs and benefits as it is about the science. Now, obviously, some of the size of the companies we deal with, there's no way we're going to be a 2 out of 10 in terms of quality of marketing thinking compared to them. But we do have some insights, we do have some knowledge, and we can actually sort of put things together that are helpful that to that discussion. So for me to do a, be a good B2C, but a good B2B business that's covering B2C, you need to talk about consumers as well. And we're quite good at that. That's very interesting. Okay, which neatly segues us to SC Johnson. Yeah. So I Googled SC Johnson and they make Pledge and they make uh, Mr. Muscle and all sorts of uh, big brands. So they are serious players uh, multinationally. No, we're, 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 we're delighted to be associated with them, of course. It's not actually SC Johnson consumers, SC Johnson professional. Okay, we're, and what, 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 what's their part of that, the SC Johnson world then? It's, it was, it, I get it's equally massive. <laughs> oh, equally massive, good. That's a very good thing. <laughs> so it's a huge company. And what they do is they, they have their technologies and brands and they spin it down to two different channels, which is what we are doing really ourselves, but in a minute way compared to them. Okay. <clears throat> so you, you know exactly the business model when you see it, because it's yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, Kimberly Clark does the same thing, a whole series of companies do it, so we're not doing anything particularly new. So uh, about, broadly, what have you signed with them? What have we said? So, the, the, so, so um, SC Johnson uh, now own a company called Deb, which is one of the biggest suppliers of hand hygiene products into UK, UK business premises, but particularly into the NHS. And oh, uh, that's an really, ideal place to be. Yes, exactly. So we were supplying, we were supplying hand sanitizers, alcohol-free hand sanitizers into the NHS ourselves, but we were struggling a bit because to do that properly, you need to put dispensers on walls, you need to service those dispensers, you need to train the nurses, you need to provide all sorts of extra, extra data on an ongoing basis in a lot of places all at the same time. They're very demanding customers. So, so while the technology was very good and passed all the NHS standards, um, we, there's no way we could do it properly. So we set about looking for a, a, a partner that could do that for us. And SC Johnson, we had a good relationship with through, uh, through Deb. And so initially our deal with them was we supplied them with liquid hand sanitizer that they, put, they then put into their dispensers. And that has now morphed into a deal where we license them the technology, they do all the manufacturing, and we don't really have to do very much apart from providing ongoing technical support and uh, new product development um, if required. And how happy are you uh, with this new deal? The fact that you've, you've reached a new level of, 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 of uh, trust with each other? Well, I think, I think, I think again, it's science-based. So if your scientists can talk to their scientists in a way that there's mutual trust developing and we are, we are supporting claims in a way that they would want to support claims, then, then, then it's validation of the business strategy that we have. 
Um, the question is, you know, when we've got sort of quite hard taskmasters, we need to keep it going and, and, and keep them happy with uh, what we're producing. But B big American just, multinationals are famously tasked to deal with. Is that right? Is that yeah. your experience? Yeah. And um, are you discussing licensing agreements with other players? And how are those discussions yeah, we have conversations along? And we, we talked about scalability earlier on, so we can scale out, we can sell a supply chain to a certain amount uh, with current resources. Um, one way to scale the business is to do more licensing uh, and more technical development deals, because what that means is they get the benefits, the licensing gets the benefits, the technology and the claims that we can provide, but then they do the manufacturing. And in most cases, to be honest, they're better at it at the scale that we're talking than than we are, so it's a natural place to go. Yes, yeah, so yes, of course, that's something. I mean, the other thing is that the um, the, the, the COVID the COVID situation is into a short to medium term boost to, to demand. By having longer term license agreements, technical development agreements in place, what you're doing is you're actually projecting you know, profitability and um, income forward for a longer time than you can do just through supplying short term demand. So that's probably where we're spending more time than we actually in terms of short term capacity at the moment. Fantastic. Thank you, that was fascinating. Many thanks, David Trainer, for joining us. For more interviews like this one, please subscribe to the London Southeast YouTube channel. My final thought, uh, thank you for watching and stay safe.